Hello everyone. The last time the sisters realized their house had blown away in a storm and they were so upset. Let's see what happens. Chapter 12 Alarms and Discoveries Contemplating the ruins of the hut that they had built up with so much care, the girls felt a very natural chagrin. You have seen a child who has erected a fine house of bricks fly into a rage when the structure topples by its own weight, or at least look utterly woebegone and leave the scattered bricks lying where they fell. Elizabeth Westmacott and her sisters felt very much the same disinclination to begin again. The site was a picture of disorder. Portions of the matting had been blown right away. Other portions in shreds and tatters had found resting places among the foliage of the surrounding trees and shrubs. Some of the caves of the roof dangled from the boss. Others littered the ground amidst a tangle of creepers and leafage. No one could have supposed that only a few hours before, the same place had been a model of neatness. It will take an age to tidy up, grumbled Tommy. Is it worthwhile to bother about a hut again? I don't like being without a roof over our heads, replied Elizabeth. But we won't start yet if you don't feel inclined. Let's go and take a look around. We shall want some breadfruit for dinner, said Mary. So we had better go that way. I dare say we shall find all we need on the ground. They set off towards the breadfruit trees. Everywhere there were signs of the violence of the store. But they were surprised and interested to notice that the worst havoc had been brought in almost a straight line across the island from southwest to northeast. It was as though some huge dark giant had gone steadily forward, wielding a monstrous scythe. The tornado had cut a clean path through the forest, leaving scarcely a tree standing over a wide space. Where there had been close, unbroken woodland was now bare avenue, interrupted by the trunks of trees that had been thrown this way and that. Impressed as the girls had been with the fury of the tornado during their time of their exposure to it, its devastating power was brought home to them now much more strongly. They looked with awe upon its ravages. How thankful we ought to be that we were not in its direct path, said Elizabeth. A little more to the right or left and we should all have trees crashing down upon us, we might have all been killed. It is a dreadful place, said Tommy, subdued and thoughtful. Oh Bess, shall we never be found and taken away? We must hope on, dear. It will never do to get downhearted. But we are all well and strong, we need not mind so very much, and the ship is sure to come this way sometime or other. Or it might pass us, said Mary. I'm sure our flag is blown away. Shall we go and see? Hadn't we better fetch our breadfruit first, now we are in this direction? Of course, we shall have to light another fire too. Ours is sure to be out. They went on. And on arriving at the breadfruit plantation found, as they had expected, that the ground was littered with fruit, which was already being devoured by land crabs, insects and birds. They picked up several that they were in good condition, and retraced their steps towards the shore. As they were passing through the fringe of woodland, Tommy stopped suddenly and went down on her knees. Oh, do look, she cried. Here's a nest on the ground, and the dearest little white parrot you ever saw. Poor little thing, I think it lost its mother. The girl stooped to look at it, and Tommy put her hand into the nest. The tiny bird rustled in alarm, opening its beak to let out a plaintive cry, but it was too young to use its wings, and Tommy took it up and held it gently. Its little heart is beating frantically, she said. Let's take it back with us and try to rear it. You know I wanted one. You think we can rear it? said Mary. It was starry we leave it, said Tommy. I should love to try. The others agreed that there was no harm in trying. So Tommy carried it carefully back with her, now and then stroking the ruffled feathers. When they got to their camp, she laid the bird on a bed of grass, killed one the breadfruits, and held a few crumbs of the pop in the palm of her hand, just below the parrot's beak. But it was too young, or perhaps too frightened, even to feed itself, and would have fared ill had it not been kept there, been a country girl, and known how to deal with such an emergency. She had seen young birds fed by hand, and she at once cut a thin stick and sharpened its end, upon which she stuck a little bit of breadfruit. Then, holding the bird in her left hand, she waited until it opened its beak to cry, and quickly slipped the food in. The little bird swallowed it greedily, much to Tommy's delight, and she went on feeding it until Elizabeth suggested that she would kill it with excess. The poor thing was hungry, said Tommy. It's not nearly so much alarm now. I shall keep it for a pet. You'll have to clip its wings then, said Mary. 
Ollie is sure to fly away as soon as he's strong enough. You do it, Mary. Be very gentle, will you? There's no need yet, perhaps, suggested Elizabeth. Do it in a day when or two when he has got over his fright. It would be just as well to put it in the boat while we are busy. You must take care not to overfeed it, Tommy. After dinner, they went first to the flagstaff. Not a shred of their scars was left, as they had no material for making another flag except their handkerchiefs, which they did not care to part with, and their wraps, which they could not spare. They had to give up for the moment any idea of erecting a signal. Then they hastened in the opposite direction, southward, to fetch bananas and oranges for the other meals of the day. A great disappointment awaited them. There was plenty of fruit on the ground, but the trees themselves, standing in the direct path of the storm, had all been uprooted or broken off, so that when they had used their present supply, they could obtain no more at this spot. It would be necessary to go once more in such a food, for they found the breadfruit too insipid to form their only vegetable diet. They knew the district between the camp and the ruined plantation. Nothing edible was to be had there. The only other place where they knew that fruit existed to the east, beyond the ridge, and even now they could not make up their minds to revisit the scene of their scare. Next day, however, when Tommy had fed her bird and Mary had clipped its wings, and they had spent an hour or so tidying up the site of the hut preparatory to rebuilding, they set off again in a southerly direction. Having resolved to extend their explorations within easy distance of the shore, crossing the broad path of uprooted trees, flattened grass, and torn undergrowth, they found as they proceeded that the ridge hemmed them in closer and closer to the sea. This was partly due to the curving of the shore, and partly to the diagonal lie of the rising ground. Little foothills of the ridge extended downwards toward the coast, forming ridges in miniature, cut here and there by streamlets. On such expeditions, Tommy almost always led the way, for her restless and active temperament was impatient of the sedator going of her sisters. But she never went far ahead, and every few minutes, as if alarmed at her own daring, she would run back and keep with the others for a time. She was thus a few yards in advance when, as she mounted a hillock, she came in sight of a number of trees clustering almost at the edge of the sea, and uttered an exclamation of surprise and pleasure. Oh, don't look here! She cried. I believe we are come to some coconut palms. You remember we saw some at Valparaiso. The others ran to join her, and Mary at once declared that she was right. There was no mistaking the tall, smooth stems with their feathery crowns. They all rushed forward eagerly. Thanks to the storm, there were several huge nuts strewing the ground around each of the tree. Tommy, who was first on the scene, picked up one of them and turned it over in her hands in a puzzled way. Is it a coconut after all? She said. It's not a bit like those I've seen in shops. It's a coconut, right enough, replied Mary. But you've got to strip out the outer husk before you come to the nut itself. Tommy whipped out her knife and began to cut away the coarse, fibrous covering. It was very tough, and she soon declared that it would never come off unless the others helped her. So they all knelt on the ground with the nut in the middle and employed their knives energetically until at last the husk was removed. The shell inside was ivory white, very different from the old brown nuts that they had been used to see in England. Being quite brittle, a small piece was easily cut off the top, and they saw the inside full of a pale, milky liquid. "You first, Tommy," said Elizabeth. "You saw the trees first. Tommy took a sip of the liquid. Delicious," she said. "I don't think I ever tasted anything so nice." She drank more, and handing the nut to Mary, continued. It's sweet, best and sour too. Something like lemonade, only not like it. It's like, oh, I don't know what it's like. Just itself, I suppose. Don't drink it all, Mary. Elizabeth, when her turn came, pronounced it a very refreshing drink, and they were all delighted at so welcome an addition to their larder. They collected as many nuts as they could carry, and returning to their camp, got them in the boat. In the course of the next few days, they went several times to the same place until they had brought back all the nuts that lay on the ground. It was fortunate that so many had been thrown down, or they did not see how they could have been obtained from them otherwise. Even Tommy, the climber of the family, confessed that she would have been beaten by the smooth, straight stem of the coconut palm. Mary had a dim recollection of reading that the natives had a way of climbing the trees by means of a rope, but she could not remember the details of the method. And in any case, Tommy could hardly have used it successfully without a good deal of practice.
Once more relieved from anxiety about food, the girls devoted themselves industriously to the reconstruction of their hut. Their former practice made the task easier. In a few days, a new house was furnished, and they were especially glad of its shelter at night instead of the cramping narrowness of the boat. Days had lengthened into weeks. The notches on their calendar trunk told them how time was flying, a sad reminder in many ways. With so little to do, they felt the hours hang heavily on their hands, though Tommy's parrot gave them a little amusement and interest. The bird had become quite used to his mistress and had learned to take food from her hand. His voice, not of very charming quality, as all confessed, grew stronger, and he became accustomed to give a quaint little scream whenever Tommy approached. She would set it on her finger and talk to it, using the same word over and over again, in the hope that it would by and by pick up a phrase or two. But although it became perfectly tame, it could never be induced with such civilized words for its natural scream and squawk. You little silly Billy, cried Tommy one day, after an hour's patient instruction. What's the good of you for a pet? There, perch on my shoulder, and don't make such an idiotic noise, for goodness sake. Tommy at last gave up at them in despair, but she became very fond of the bird, and declared that when they were rescued, she would certainly take it home with her. It was wonderful how the hope of rescue never died, when each day ended without the sight of the long fought vessel. They would say, never mind, perhaps you would come tomorrow. And when tomorrow had the same disappointment, there was still tomorrow. So they lived from day to day, veering from hope to despondency, and from despondency to hope again. They had almost forgotten Tommy's fright. Surely, they thought, they must have seen someone by this time when the island was inhabited. Yet there was the same misgiving, the same disinclination to cross the ridge. Elizabeth laughed at herself and more than once said that she must really break through her reluctance. But it ended there. Her heart failed her when it came to the point. Easy though their life was, it had its discomforts. The breadfruit gave out, and having found no more oranges or bananas, they grew very tired of a diet of fish and coconuts. They had seen other fruits, and shrubs bearing berries that looked very enticing, but the fear of poison deterred them from trying anything that they did not know. The want of a change of clothes too was a trouble to them, and their boots had become unwearable. They had often been soaked in seawater, and then drying in the sun had cracked and become worse than useless. They got into the habit of going barefoot, except when they set out for a long walk. In the hut and when walking on the grass, they were comfortable enough, but on rough ground they suffered a good deal at first. In the course of time, however, helped by frequent soaking in seawater, their feet became unhardened, and they felt no inconvenience in going about unshod. They had more than once noticed some very small bees, hardly larger than houseflies, flitting among the flowers. One day, Elizabeth suggested that they should try to find out whether these pollination bees made honey. They saw where it was. Tommy hailed the suggestion, and started at once to track the bees to their nest. For a long time, she had no success. Only after many days did she, almost by accident, light upon a bee's nest in the hole in the trunk of a tree. Informing her sisters of the discovery, she proposed that they should smoke the bees out. They kindled a small fire at the base of the tree, immediately beneath the hole. When they thought they had allowed plenty of time for the smoke to stupefy the bees, they put on their Macintoshes, pulling the hoods well down over their heads, and prepared to rifle the hole. It was so small that a hand could scarcely pass through it, and Mary suggested that they should enlarge it, so that they might see what they were doing. Accordingly, they stripped off the bark round the hole until it was much more capacious. Unluckily, the inrush of fresh air appeared to revive the little inhabitants, which darted out with fierce budding, putting the robbers to utter rout. They ran off with their heads down, waving their arms wildly to beat on the fierce insects. Tommy got out scot free, but Elizabeth and Mary were stung slightly, and but for the smoking, which had not been wholly ineffectual. The bees would probably have hurt them severely. We won't be beaten by parcels, silly bees, said Tommy as they went home. You aren't much hurt, are you? I feel burning by my cheek, said Elizabeth. And one of my fingers is swelling, added Mary. As we haven't got any ointment or anything, you'll just have to get well by yourselves, remarked Tommy. You'll have another try, won't you? Oh yes, we'll give the larger dose next time, said Elizabeth. I think we ought to have some reward for our enterprise. A day or two afterwards, they visited the hole again, 
By means of a larger fire, fed with leaves that gave out very pungent smoke, they managed to stupefy the beast thoroughly. When they examined the hole, they were surprised to find not large combs, as in an English hive, but a collection of bags of brown wax, about the size of a walnut, united in a regular mass. Fancy bees having foreign ways, said Tommy. I should have thought that bees were the same all the world over. I don't see why bees shouldn't be different like people, said Mary. They're very intelligent. The others laughed at this curious reason for differences of habit. The honey they found was more fluid than they were accustomed to in England, and in taste and smell it was slightly scented. They took a good quantity home with them, but it did not go very well with fish, and even with coconuts it was a doubtful joy. If only we had some breadfruit or even bananas, we should like it better. We can only get those by going across the ridge again, said Elizabeth. Shall we venture? I won't, said Tommy decidedly. I'm not going to be scared out of my wits for anybody. I'll go with you, Bess, said Mary, after a little hesitation. It really is silly to be afraid of nothing. But as it turned out, the first of the three to break the peril was, after all, Tommy herself. Chapter 13 Lost That night, for the first time in their residence on the island, the girls were wakened by a patter of rain. Only once before had rain fallen, and that was during the tornado. Now the sound of it upon the thatch of the hut was very slight, but the girls slept so lightly that a whisper was almost enough to disturb them. I hope we are not in for another smash up, said Elizabeth, finding that her sisters were both awake. There's no wind at present, returned Mary. Rain alone won't hurt us. I expect it's the rainy season beginning, and we shall have weeks of it. How disgusting, exclaimed Tommy. I always hated having to stay indoors, and it'll be worse than ever here, with no cozy fire and nice storybook. What's the time, Bess? She leaned over Elizabeth, who lay next to her, and showed the light with her match lighter. Elizabeth looked at her watch, which she never forgot to wind. It's about four o'clock, she said. Time for another snooze before daylight, said Tommy, snuggling down into her wraps. In a minute or two, she was fast asleep. The other girls remained wide awake and talked quietly together. I wish we knew our whereabouts better, said Elizabeth. If only we knew what those islands are that we have seen in the distance, we might perhaps row to one of them and find friends. Yes, of course they are missionaries, said Mary. Don't you remember Uncle Ben told us of a friend of his who was returning to his station? What was his name, Bess? I forgot. We can't venture across the sea, can we? Oh no, there are thousands of islands, and I believe some have never been visited by white people at all. We might land among cannibals. We are certainly better off here. I can't believe there are any people on this island, inspired Tommy. Or why haven't we seen something of them? We'll go to the ridge after breakfast, and as we said, and settle the matter once and for all. Supposing there are people, said Mary. As I said before, I think we ought to try and make friends with them. And if they seem inclined to be unfriendly, perhaps we could make them afraid of us. Tommy's match lighter would startle them, wouldn't it? It might, but I don't like to think of having to rely on that sort of thing for our safety. They would soon find out our real weakness and then... Oh, I do hope we shall not see anybody. We should be so much more uncomfortable. Tommy's birthday is somewhere about now. We can't be quite sure of the date, because we didn't begin to cut notches at once. We should be right within a day or two. The present she would like best would be some oranges from beyond the ridge, and certain news that the island is uninhabited. How strange it seems to hope that there are no human beings near us. You know, Bess, I think the people of these islands must be very melancholy. Why should you think that? I've always supposed them to be happy, light-hearted folk, with not a care in the world. But they have nothing to do. Their food grows for them without work, and they don't need many clothes. They have no books to read, no amusements. How do you know that? Well, what amusements can they have? Is only civilized people who play games? I don't know. I seem to remember that even savages gamble. If that is amusement, it wouldn't be to me if I lost. They are no sport, Bess, said Tommy, who had awakened and caught the last few words. It's the excitement they like, whether they win or lose. I should be a dreadful gambler, I know, if I had the chance. And I hope you'll never have it, dear, said Elizabeth. It is an unhealthy excitement, I am sure. We were talking about your birthday, Tommy. It might be yesterday, today, or tomorrow, but you are 14. Will you show him many happy returns now? Oh, I wish you hadn't reminded me, cried Tommy. 
think of being 15 and 16 and 20 and getting all of these islands. I don't want to grow old at all and it will be dreadful here. I'd be a scullery maid or beggar girl, anything in England, rather than stay here. Shall I ever get away? And Tommy nestled to Elizabeth's side. And as she lay encompassed by her elder sister's arm, she prayed with all her heart that God would send help to them soon. When dawn broke and they got up, it was a dreary well upon which they looked. Sea and earth were covered with a clinging mist. A drizzle was falling. Everything was sodden and forlorn. The fire was out, and there were no dry sticks for relighting it. They had to content themselves with a breakfast of coconuts. And then they sat inside the hut, too much depressed in spirit to go out or to do anything but watch the rain. Presently, the drizzle became a downpour, which went on for an hour or two, then suddenly ceased, the sun bursting through the leaden sky. They took advantage of this to gather a quantity of twigs, which they carried into the hut to dry there. Elizabeth had just suggested that Mary and she should start on their expedition to the ridge, when a sharp shower drove them again to shelter, so it went on all day. Heavy showers that lasted for a few minutes, alternating with brief, bright intervals. There was no doubt that the rainy season had begun. The girls were practically confined to the hut for many days in succession, only sailing for to catch fish, which they cooked at a new stove built nearer the hut. The showers were sometimes light, sometimes very heavy, and at last the rain began to drip through the thatched roof, and the girls had to sit in their Macintoshes. Though the sun appeared every now and then, it did not shine long enough to dry the ground before another downpour soaked it. They all became very low-spirited, and could not find any occupation to pass away the time, or even weeding was impossible with the sodden grass. Their troubles came to a climax one day when Mary complained of a racking headache. Feeling her heart broke, Elizabeth feared she had taken a fever, no doubt owing to exhalation from the damp earth working on a lowered system. She and Tommy felt much concern, which became real alarm when they found Mary rapidly becoming worse. She could not eat, and lay on her mat, bed covered with the Macintoshes and wraps of the other girls. Her cheeks flushed, her eyes bright and glassy. Towards evening, when Elizabeth had left the hut to fetch water for the night, and Tommy sat by the invalid, she was startled to hear Mary talking in a very strange way. No milk today, there's something wrong with Dapple. Jane! Uncle Ben's coming tomorrow, don't forget the... Then her voice died away into an indistinguishable muttering. Presently, Tommy caught more phrases. Oh no no, they'll eat us, don't let Tommy go. Bess, Ben, they're coming after me. Then we'll carry the luggage, Uncle. So she raved on in her delirium, babbling about the farm, the ship, her friends, a word every now and again, showing how much the fear of cannibals had occupied the background of her mind. Tommy was terrified. She had never seen anyone delirious except her father just before he died, and she was smitten with an agonizing fear that Mary would not recover. Oh, Bess! She's out of her mind, she cried piteously as Elizabeth returned. What shall we do? Elizabeth went quickly to her bed, dipped a handkerchief in the water she had brought, and laid it on Mary's fevered hand. We must sit up with her tonight, she said. Don't give way, Tommy dear, she will soon be better. The fever came on so suddenly that I am sure it's one of those sharp attacks that don't last long, but it will leave her very weak, and we must be very careful of her. I do wish we had some oranges, the juice is so cooling. But it was too late to think of looking for oranges, and they had to be satisfied with water and coconut milk, which they gave Mary in sips. All night long they remained at her side, watching her with distress as her cheek chattered as if with cold. And then next moment she tossed about her little mat bed and flung the Macintoshes off as if she could not bear the heat. Elizabeth tried to induce Tommy to lie down for a little, but the young girl refused, saying that she could not rest until she knew that Mary was better. I will get some oranges tomorrow, said Elizabeth. I am sure they will do her good. Towards morning, Mary dropped off to sleep, and then Tommy was persuaded to lie down. The sun had risen when she awoke to find Elizabeth still watching over her sleeping sister. I'll just run down to the stream and bathe my face, said Elizabeth. She is still asleep. Give her a little water if she wakes. I shan't be long. Luckily it's a fine morning. She returned in a few minutes. Now you run down and wash, Tommy, she said. It'll freshen you. I put in some fish to bake for breakfast. Tommy rose and left the hut. 
During Elizabeth's absence, she had strung herself up to a great resolution. Mary must have oranges, but the one to fetch them should not be Elizabeth. She was so calm and steady and capable that she would do far better to stay and look after Mary. I can be best spared, thought Tommy. I know Bess won't let me I go and propose it. I shall just do it without telling her. It won't take long to scamper to the orange grove and back again. She had not forgotten her former fright, but she told herself that perhaps she might get to the oranges without being observed, and she was ready to do anything for Mary, a home she was very fond, though they sparred sometimes. So, after bathing her face in the stream, she went to the stove and scratched on the sand in front of it with her knife the words, Gone to the orange grove. Then, without waiting, for fear her courage failed, she ran swiftly along the bank of the stream, munching a piece of coconut as she went. In the hut, Mary had awakened perfectly sensible and wondering why she felt so weak. Elizabeth bathed her face and hands, moved her hair, and having tried to make her a little more comfortable, gave her a drink of coconut milk. Hmm. What's the matter with me, Bess? she asked. You've had a touch of fever. You'll soon be all right again. I'm going to get you some oranges presently. You will enjoy them. Yes, I shall. Sure. Have I been ill long? I feel as weak as anything. Only one night, dear. We shall have to feed you up. You ought to have beef tea or chicken broth, of course. But we shall have to do the best we can. I think we must try to snare a bird of some sort. Where's Tommy? Just run down to wash. I dare say she'll bring back the fish with her. I put some to bake. You could eat a little, couldn't you? I'll try, but I don't feel much like eating. I want to go to sleep again. And indeed, in a few minutes she was sleeping. The very best thing she could do, said Elizabeth to herself. A quarter of an hour passed and Tommy had not returned. I wonder why she's lagging, thought Elizabeth. She went to the entrance and the hut and looked down towards the shore. The trees hid the stove from her, and she did not call out for fear of waking Mary. She went back into the hut and sat down. But after five minutes, when there was still no Tommy, her vague wonder grew into a slight feeling of alarm. Seeing that Mary was still asleep, she went out again and ran down swiftly towards the shore, glancing to the left with half expectation, discovering Tommy fishing on the rocks. But Tommy was not in sight, and Elizabeth soon learned why, as her eye caught the scribble on the sand. How plucky, she thought, but the child will be terrified before she gets there. I'd better fetch her back. But with a moment's reflection, she saw that she could not expect to catch Tommy before she reached the top of the ridge. If there was any danger, Tommy would have run into it by the time she could be overtaken. Mary was so weak that Elizabeth did not care to leave her for long, but she ran some distance up the stream as far as a broad, bare avenue made by the storm, and then was on the point of giving a shrill call when she checked herself. The sound might cause the very harm she wished to avoid. Perturbed and somewhat vexed as well, she hastened back, feeling that at present Mary must be a chief care. She reflected that after all, though they had been now more than two months on the island, they had never met any other person and had no real reason to think it was inhabited. Surely if the object Tommy had seen was actually a human being, they would by this time have other evidence of his existence. Thus reassuring herself, she hurried back took out of the oven the fish that was already overbaked and regained the hut. To her great relief, Mary was still fast asleep. Elizabeth dreaded the effect upon her if she suspected that anything had happened to Tommy. As she ate her breakfast, reserving some of the fish for Tommy, she felt decidedly annoyed at the young girl's escapade. Tommy ought to have mentioned what she intended, thought Elizabeth, but Tommy had been from the earliest years impulsive and heedless. So that her present disobedience was so Elizabeth had come to regard it, forgetting that no instruction had been given, was quite a piece with her former instances. Then Elizabeth made a to Tommy in her heart. She has been very good all this time, she thought. I do wish she would come back. But the hours dragged by, and still Tommy had not appeared. Mary awoke, and looking around the hut, inquired again for Tommy. She has run up to get some oranges said Elizabeth as calmly as she could, though she felt very troubled. Tommy has, said Mary in surprise, gone alone to where she saw the face, or oh, you shouldn't have let her best. I wouldn't have, only I did not know. She scrawled on the sand to say that she had gone. I suppose she thought I would make a better noise than she. 
She's a dear brave girl, said Mary, and I shall like the oranges all the better. Elizabeth got her to eat a little fish, old as it now was, and presently she dropped off to sleep again. It was past dinner time, the sun was very hot, and Elizabeth, thoroughly alarmed at Tommy's protracted essence, wondered if, after a trying night, she had been so overcome by the heat and was perhaps lying helpless somewhere. She felt that she must try to find her, so slipping out of the hut, she ran as fast as her feet would carry her up through the woods, never pausing until she had crossed the ridge and come to the orange grove. She had looked about her as she ran, and now, regardless of consequences, had called Tommy several times, but she saw neither her nor any living person, and there was no answer to her calls. At the grove, there were oranges and bananas scattered here and there on the ground, so that Tommy's absence could not be due to any difficulty in what she came for. And then Elizabeth's heart stood still as she noticed at one point a strange collection of objects. There were four or five oranges on the ground close together, and with them Tommy's knife, the little stick she had let fed her parrot with, a piece of hair ribbon, and a wedge of coconut. What had happened? These objects were obviously the contents of Tommy's pocket. Why had she placed them there? And where was she? Had she been startled? Had some natives come stealthily upon her and seize her? Would they not have at least taken the knife at the same time? Elizabeth felt a shiver of fear along with utter bewilderment, but she crushed down her uneasy imaginings and placing Tommy's belongings in her pocket, began to search among the trees, shouting from time to time, no matter who might hear her. Suddenly, her eye was caught by a flutter of a small colored object some distance among the bushes. With a thrill of hope, she hastened towards it. But long before she reached it, she realized her hope was vain. The object was only a bit of tattered cloth attached to one of the line of poles they had seen on their former visit. Retracing her steps to the orange grove, she went in and out among the trees, shouting Tommy's name again and again. Her distress at Tommy's disappearance was coupled with anxiety about Mary. It was now a considerable time she had left her hut, and she felt that, with Mary so weak and helpless, she could not stay to search any longer. Trusting a few oranges in her pocket for the invalid, she hastened back, conscious that she herself was weak and shaky. The long, anxious search in the fierce sunlight, following a sleepless night, had been almost too much for her strength. She tried to enter the hut unconcernedly, with a dim hope that Tommy might have returned before her. Mary was awake. Why did you leave me? She said in the querulous tone of an invalid, her eyes filling with tears. I called and called for you and Tommy, but you wouldn't come. I'm so miserable. Have some oranges, dear, said Elizabeth gently. I will squeeze the juice into a cup for you. It will do you good. Thank you so much. I'm a wretched bad patient. Yes, dear, but I got into my silly head that you had deserted me. Ridiculous, wasn't it? This is delicious. It was kind of Tommy to get them for me. Where is she? Elizabeth was in a quandary. Mary seemed a little better. Her querulousness was a good sign, but it would not further her recovery to tell her that Tommy was missing. On the other hand, Elizabeth herself was so much distressed that she would like to pour out her troubles to a sympathetic ear. But she thought it best to keep the bad news to herself for the present and said, She mustn't quite recover the courage and gone roaming. You are getting on, aren't you, dear? Yes, only rather weak still. But these oranges are delicious. I feel much refreshed. Don't sit up with me tonight, Bess. I am sure I shall be alright. And you mustn't wear yourself out. Put some oranges near me, so that I can get one tonight without disturbing you. She soon fell asleep again and did not awaken until it was quite dark. She was careful not to disturb her sister, and so did not become aware until the morning that Tommy had not returned. Elizabeth had spent a sleepless night and felt quite worn out when day broke. Mary was quick to notice her distress of which she knew she could not be the cause, since she was so much better. You are hiding something best. Tell me, has something happened to Tommy? Elizabeth on the verge of a breakdown was glad to pour out the whole story. Oh, why didn't you tell me before? cried Mary. You must go and look for her again. There is really nothing the matter with me now. Do, please go, Bess. It's awful to think of what may have happened. Hastily getting Mary a little food, Elizabeth set out for the orange grove and searched it in the neighborhood through and through, calling Tommy's name until she was hoarse. 
Once in response to a shout, she thought she heard a faint cry and hurried in the direction from which she was said to have come. At that moment, she felt that she would have welcomed the appearance of a native. The sight of any human face would have been a comfort, but her search was still fruitless. Neither Tommy nor anyone else appeared, and Elizabeth thought she must have been mistaken. The birds were trilling and chattering in the woods, and among so many sounds, it was easy to deceive oneself. At length, when she had been several hours absent, she felt that she must return in case Mary should be wondering whether she too had disappeared. She could hardly drag herself home. At the entrance of the hut, she found Mary looking anxiously toward the ridge. You shouldn't have got up, she said. Oh Mary, I can't find her, and I am so tired. For a moment, it looked as if she would break down utterly, but she controlled herself, and in response to Mary's entreaty, lay down to rest. Fatigue even overcame her distress of mind, and for an hour or two she slept heavily. Then she awoke with a start, and declared that she must go and search again. Swallowing a little food, she set off, and thoroughly hunted over a wider area than before, not returning until the evening. It's no good, she said despairingly. Poor Tommy is gone. Don't say so, said Mary. You haven't seen anyone, have you? Nobody. Then she may only be lost. You know how venturesome she is, and having found no one to be afraid of, perhaps she has gone right over the island and sprained her ankle or something. Have a good sleep, Bess. Tomorrow we'll both go. I'm sure I shall be strong enough. Next morning, after a breakfast of bananas and oranges, for well, there was, of course, no fish, the girls set off together. Mary, although a little tottery, as she said, was able to walk slowly, and she declared that it was much better for her to go too than to remain at home wondering what was happening. Elizabeth had to support her, and she stopped for frequent rest, but they came at length to the orange grove. Now I'll stay here, in the shade of the trees, while you go round and round. And if you don't find her here, go right over the ridge and call me every few seconds. I won't stir until you come back. Tommy was probably in the wrong to think about running off to find oranges, but she really cared about Mary. She wanted to surprise her. But since they didn't have GPS at this time, considering that GPS never existed, it was a rather foolish idea in the first place. I really hope nothing happens to any of them since Mary got over her fever. So, tune in next week and let's hope that the sisters find each other again.